Most of us understand that different molecules can emit light and that this light has a spectral profile, spectral characteristics. And from these characteristics, we can infer the chemical interactions that are occurring. Physicists, for instance, may understand that the atom helium was first discovered on the sun through the use of spectral analysis. Chemists may recognize that spectroscopy can use to determine the concentration of a solution. Well, now spectral analysis has moved to biology. My work this semester has been to determine if the method spectral phaser analysis can be used to determine a spectral shift in different genomic DNA microenvironments. If we take a look at this schematic, we can see the model that my work aims to test. At the bottom, we have a chromosome. This chromosome will be interacting with an oligonucleotide probe with a fluorophore attached to it, which emits light at a specific wavelength and width. It has its specific spectral profile. Just to the left of the chromosome, we have histone cores wrapped around with DNA. Those two are interacting with an oligonucleotide probe with a fluorophore attached, which emits light at a spectrum as well. The spectrum with these has shifted because of the different microenvironment that exists around the histone core. Likewise, up the top, we have double-stranded DNA. A probe may be hybridized to this DNA and it will emit light at a slightly different spectral wavelength and width, changing its spectral profile. It is my hope that from identifying differences in these spectral profiles, we will be able to isolate genomic DNA microenvironments inside a living cell. So what is spectral phaser analysis? Spectral phaser analysis is a live cell analysis technique. It combines confocal imaging, which collects fluorescence intensity data, with spectroscopic analysis, which measures spectral data like lambda max and spectral width. From the diagram, we can see that lambda max is the wavelength at which the spectrum hits maximum uh, fluorescence intensity. We can also see the average spectral width, which is marked across the wavelength, and fluorescence intensity is marked on the y-axis. So effectively, what spectral phaser analysis does is allows us to isolate pixels in an image that share spectral characteristics. Data analysis typically occurs with what's known as an XY lambda scan, or a lambda scan for short. Data collection occurs on an XY focal plane, marked here by all the blue squares. Each one of those blue squares represents a pixel in the image. Fluorescence intensity data is collected for each one of these pixels. Across the entirety of a spectral range that is selected by the user, Fluorescence intensity data is collected at regular incremental steps across this spectral range. This is marked here by the lambda plane, heading backwards in colours from the blue squares. So what effectively happens is that each pixel in an image gets its own unique spectral profile. This is extremely important because it allows us to select these pixels based on that spectral profile. So by isolating these pixels, we're actually able to isolate microenvironments in the image based on their spectral characteristics. After data collection through the lambda scan, the data is Fourier transformed and plotted onto a phaser plot. This is where spectral analysis becomes spectral phaser analysis. The spectral profile of each of the pixels in the image is plotted onto the 360 degree phaser plot. The lambda max values are plotted descending in an anti-clockwise direction. The spectral width values are plotted increasing into the center of the phaser plot. The closer towards the center of the phaser we get, the broader the width of the spectral profile. Here we can see three different uses of spectral phaser analysis. In the bottom left, we can see the separation of autofluorescence in grass. These are autofluorescent molecules. There are no probes or dyes in this stain. And what happens is the spectral profile of these molecules has been plotted on the phaser. Cursors have been used to isolate pixels in the image with those specific spectral profiles. And then if we look down at the images, the composite image and the separated images, 
we can see that we've actually isolated microenvironments in the grass based on the spectral profiles of the autofluorescent molecules. In the next image along, we can see microenvironments have been isolated in a cell, this time using dyes that are commercially available. Once again, cursors have been placed on the face of plot. These cursors select pixels in the image that have specific spectral details, specific lambda max and spectral width details. What this does is it essentially allows biologists to unmix signals where they may be overlapping. We may have spectral profiles emitted by molecules that are very close together, overlapping, that we can't see by normal fluorescence intensity data. And we use the spectral analysis to unmix these signals and to isolate microenvironments from the unmixed signals. Just to the right of that, again, we can see application to the live cell environment. Here, spectral differences in the fluorescent probe pyronin Y have been used to isolate RNA microenvironments. What's important here is that these microenvironments have actually been isolated in a living cell. If we look to the phase and just to the right of that, we have a purple cursor, a yellow cursor, and a blue cursor. These cursors are isolating the pixels in the image that have those specific spectral profiles. So what this past work shows us is that spectral phaser analysis is able to isolate microenvironments based on spectral profiles, and that it's also applicable to the live cell environment. My Masters of Research project aims to test the ability of spectral phaser analysis to identify genomic DNA microenvironments in live cells. I also seek to see if I can isolate the spatial location of a gene inside a living cell. This has been previously attempted through the use of fusion proteins. Proteins that bind specifically to histones or centromeres have been bound to fluorescent proteins such as green fluorescent protein. One problem with this is that green fluorescent protein can change the conformation of the protein specific to the histones or centromeres. This can produce non-specific binding and therefore artifacts in the image. One other problem is that this method isn't yet specific to finding genetic loci, such as a gene. Another such method takes advantage of the LAC operator system. Multiple copies of the LAC operator are transfected into a living cell. A fluorescent protein, such as GFP, is fused to a LAC repressor. This repressor fusion protein will bind to the LAC operator and allow us to visualize that genomic loci inside a living cell. This may help us understand how genes are organized in the cell nucleus. One problem with this is it's not really well suited to eukaryotes. There is a poor signal to noise ratio and often large numbers of the LAC operator need to be transfected into the organism. Another problem is that once again, it's not specific to a genetic loci. It relies on the LAC operator being transfected into the organism, so it doesn't really help us find the location of genes specific to that organism. My research project aims to use spectral phaser analysis to determine if the spectral profile of a fluorescent probe changes under hybridization to a target gene. If spectral phaser analysis can identify spectral differences in different genomic DNA microenvironments, such as hybridization or Hoogston pairing, self annealing or hydrogen bonding, then we may be able to use differences in these spectral profiles to determine where these different isolation microenvironments are. So when a labelled probe is hybridised to a gene, it may exhibit a different spectral profile from when it's not hybridised to that specific gene. So we can really see that spectral phaser analysis is integral to my project. My project is wholly reliant on spectral phase analysis's ability to identify spectral shift in different genomic DNA microenvironments. Consequently, that's what I tested this semester. So how did I do this? Well, my protocol had four treatments. The Alexa 4A8 treatment, which is just the fluorophore by itself, kind of like a control. Another treatment was an oligonucleotide probe, let's call it an ODN hybridized to the Alexa 488 molecule. This probe was actually made by Sarah Barry as part of her honors thesis project. This acted like a second control. I tested two different genomic DNA microenvironments. 
First was the ODN treatment mixed on a microscope slide with murine genomic DNA. The second genomic DNA microenvironment was the same murine genomic DNA mixed with the ODN treatment, but this time it was annealed. Data analysis occurred through XY Lambda scan, and spectral phaser analysis used a program SIMFCS 3.0 available through the Laboratory for Fluorescence Dynamics. Using SIMFCS, background fluorescence was removed to the drop periphery, as you can see here in the bottom left. Cursor was placed on the white square, which represents the most numerous number of pixels in the image that share spectral characteristics. This generated spectral width and lambda max values, which were plotted in Excel. Data was recorded at laser powers of 10, 20 and 40 percent, and time since data acquisition began was noted throughout. I plotted the laser power and laser exposure times, mainly to determine if these were going to be mitigating factors during spectral phaser analysis. As you can see for the ODN treatment, lambda max actually increased with exposure time. This was different compared to the ODN and genomic DNA treatment. Lambda max remained stable in this treatment. One possibility is that in the genomic DNA treatment, the ODN was more protected from the laser exposure, while the ODN by itself was exposed to the laser. This may have increased self-annealing in the ODN treatment. This self-annealing may have changed the microenvironment and in turn changed the spectral profile. You can also see that the spectral width for both treatments decreased with increased laser power. What these results show us is that laser exposure time and laser power are both mitigating factors that need to be controlled during spectral phaser analysis. So can spectral phaser analysis identify spectral shifts in genomic DNA microenvironments? Well, it turns out it can. As we can see from these two phaser plots, one of the ODN plus genomic DNA and the annealed ODN plus genomic DNA treatment, that the phaser has actually shifted in towards the center, increasing in width, and around towards the right, which is decreasing in wavelength. While these phaser plots just represent one image at 20% power, when I plotted all data out into XL, we can see how these graph out. What I found was there was a significant decrease in lambda max between the annealed and not annealed oligonucleotide and genomic DNA treatments. There was also a significant increase in width between the annealed and not annealed treatments. These results show us that there are spectral differences between genomic DNA microenvironments, and spectral phaser analysis can elucidate these differences. These results confirm the previous work that saw that spectral phaser analysis could identify different microenvironments based on their spectral characteristics. There was possibly one limitation in their study. Treatments were pipetted in two microliter and 10 microliter droplets directly onto a cover slip and placed on the inverted water immersion objective. This meant that there was some drop evaporation during the analysis. As all the treatments had buffers, this evaporation may have created osmolality increases in the microenvironment. These microenvironment changes may have created unintended spectral shifts during data collection. There have been studies that use mineral oil to cover micro droplets during single cell culture. It is feasible that mineral oil be used in future studies to prevent drop evaporation. These studies should be more robust and could include analysis with cDNA and the use of gene-specific probes to determine hybridization to a target. Future work could also extend to osmolality studies specifically to determine if osmolality increases or decreases change the microenvironment and therefore change spectral shift. Also, the use of existing technologies like FISH could be used to determine if spectral profiles change between hybridized and non-hybridized probes. Finally, this work could extend to live cell characterization. It could then be determined if spectral phaser analysis is able to elucidate the spatial location of a gene in a live cell. While more work needs to be done to extend this technology to the live cell environment, and certain factors need to be mitigated during spectral phaser analysis, 
it is at least clear that spectral phaser analysis is able to identify spectral shifts in genomic DNA microenvironments. Although this was a pre-recorded presentation, I did prepare some example question slides in anticipation of questions in a live presentation setting. Firstly, Fourier transformation is the computational unmixing of a signal. A good way to think about it is we have a musical chord and say we're able to determine the volume and each note inside that chord just from hearing that chord. It's kind of how Fourier transformation works. So basically every signal is made up of a series of sine waves. So we are able to computationally unmix that signal into its constituent sine waves. So will labeled DNA oligonucleotide probes be able to actually traffic to the nucleus in a live cell? Well, it turns out that some of my colleagues from WSU have actually been looking at this. As it so happens, Alexa 488 labeled DNA oligonucleotides in live myoblasts have seen to be trafficked to the nucleus. And as we can see from the graph on the right, the rate of migration of these probes depends largely on the size of the DNA oligonucleotide. For my master's thesis, I will be using short labelled probes to enable this trafficking. Likewise, in this study, the length of the probes was 20 base pairs long. Lastly, I've included some more of my data. Here we see spectral wavelength, spectral lambda max increasing with laser power for the ODN and ODN plus GDNA treatments. And to the right of that, we can see a reduction in width as laser power increases between both treatments. So it's quite clear from this data that spectral shift occurs between laser power increases. Spectral phaser analysis identifies spectral shifts in genomic DNA microenvironments.